This is the biggest Audi SUV that's fully electric. It's the Audi Q8 e-tron. Now it used to be called the Audi e-tron, but now it's got the Q8 name as well as the other Q8 models to help you figure out where it sits in the range. I'm gonna tell you about it in this review. The Audi Q8 nameplate includes a few different models, including a couple of petrol versions. There's also a diesel model. There's a plug-in hybrid as well, and an SQ8 and an RSQ8. So this model range is already diverse. And now there's this, which is the Q8 e-tron, a fully electric model, which actually isn't like the other Q8s at all. By Audi's own admission, it's a very different type of car. It's the existing Audi e-tron, just rebranded so you can imagine where it sits in the model lineup. So it's an eight, and eight means luxury in Audi land, and that means that this is quite an expensive vehicle, not as expensive as some other high-end electric SUVs, but you're looking at more than $150,000 for the SUV version. There's also a Sportback model, which adds $12,000 to the price tag, but includes a few extras as well. You get bigger wheels, get a few other features inside and out and you also get the swoopy roofline but no roof rails which you do get on the SUV version and this one here is the e-tron 55 launch edition version so it has a few extras as well it gets the black mask look at the front end it's also got a black exterior design package you get bigger wheels black interior design package with a black headliner as well but look you do get a lot of equipment for your money when you're buying this spec of car there will be other versions of the e-tron q8 model range as well including a lower spec version which will be more affordable and an sq8 performance model too i'll tell you a bit more about the powertrain shortly but first let's talk about some of the competitors to this suv I'm always thinking of your budget and I do have some models in this section which you might also want to consider which come in at lower pricing than this car. So, I mean, if budget isn't a big deal for you, I've got some of those models as well that you might want to consider. But firstly, I would recommend if you're looking for a large electric luxury SUV, you should check out the BMW iX. It has four different grades available, including a very expensive one if that's what you really, really want. But I reckon it's a really interesting EV SUV uh, the look might not be to everyone's tastes, but I think that it has a really charming technical, but also characterful interior. Um, and it really sort of feels like a big blown up spiritual successor to the BMW i3, which I think was a fantastic car, but hey, very, very different, obviously. Another model you might want to check out that's been around for a very long time is the Jaguar I-Pace. Now, it does have a couple of different variants available, and look, it's getting a bit long in the tooth, but I think it's a really interestingly shaped and styled car. It certainly has Jaguar presence to it, and it really does have a fair bit to like. But hey, I've also had a couple of little tech gremlins with that car in the past when I've driven it, but hopefully they've ironed out those little annoyances by now. It has been refreshed and revamped a few times over its life cycle, but hey, Tell me what you think in the comments. Would you choose an iPace or an iX or this? Or would you maybe consider a more affordable electric SUV? Now, there's a couple that I reckon you probably should check out. If electric and SUV or crossover is what you're really after, firstly, the Kia EV6. Now, for 100 grand, you can get a faster, better, nicer car than this if you buy the EV6 GT. Check out my review of it up there. Um, there's also the Kia EV9. And if you need a family large SUV, that thing has three rows of seats, fully electric, and a lower price point than this. Hmm, food for thought. It is a large SUV. It's pretty substantial. It's more than 4.9 meters long. So this isn't gonna fit in everyone's garage, um, although it isn't necessarily imposing in the way that it's designed. It has a nice sleek design to it. This one here is the launch edition model. So it gets an extra blackout pack, which does look pretty cool. It's got black wheels as well, which um, I'm not such a fan of the aero wheel look, but let me know what you reckon. Uh, and also I'll just mention that now you get Audi on the B pillar, but also the model derivative is listed here as well. That's laser etched, which is kind of cool. Now, big SUV, big enough boot. So boot space for this large SUV is actually pretty large. You'll see the figures on your screen now. That's for the SUV body shape. Um, and if you are considering the Sportback model, apparently it's the more popular version of this vehicle. It has 
well, the swoopier roof, a slightly smaller boot, but it's still pretty big. What I do like about the Q8 e-tron is that it does come with a space saver spare wheel under the boot floor, which just means that at least you have the peace of mind that if you were to get a flat out on a country road somewhere, well, you might not have to end up calling a tow truck, Maybe you might do that anyway, but you've got that little safeguard there as well. There's a little storage section behind there as well, and you get a couple of tie down points for cables and nets and stuff like that, and a couple of little shopping bag hooks in the boot too. So it is a pretty practical boot size. I wouldn't say that it's the biggest that you can get if you're looking at a car that's almost five meters long, but it is certainly big enough for a family of three or four to go away for a weekend pretty comfortably, I would say. The interior of the Q8 e-tron doesn't really feel dissimilar to the other Q8 models, but it's also very similar to the existing e-tron model. So I don't think that's a bad thing because the interior of this car is high-end, luxury feeling. It's got that German Audi technical vibe going on. And I love the finishes, the materials used in this car are really high-end, as you would expect when you're spending this kind of money on a car, right? So you've got this lovely leather line steering wheel, this sort of, uh, I guess it's like an aluminium style finish across the top of the dashboard. You've got leathery bits up the top, not real leather. Leather seats as well, they're very comfy and very well uh, form fitted, I would say. They're sporty seats in this launch edition version. Uh, you do get a more standard seat in the entry level version, but still a very nice seat. I uh, spent a few hours in one yesterday. Um, there's other elements to the design of this cabin which do take some getting used to, like the gear selector. Um, it's not really like a traditional gear selector. It's a little toggle switch on the edge of this. It's almost like a cod piece, I would say. Uh, but yeah, there's a park button on the end of it as well. So that might take a little bit of getting used to, but it's there so you get extra space behind it. So you've got adjustable cup holders down there. There's a wireless phone charger with a little cradle so you can actually uh, sort of holster your phone in there so it's out of sight as well which is good to see a little small storage cubby behind there as well under the armrest bottle holders in the door so it is a practical family-ish SUV and it does have some interesting elements to the controls when it comes to uh, let's say your air conditioning and fan controls and that sort of stuff they're done through this bottom screen now Having stuff done through a screen is not for everyone, but at least you do get um, haptic feedback on that screen rather than just touching a screen and hoping that things will happen. At least you get some kind of reactiveness from the screen underneath. That's where your seat heating controls are as well. There's a few other controls in that bottom panel too. And up the top, you'll find your media control panel as well. Sat nav, that sort of stuff is through there. You can also keep an eye on the car situation. So if you wanna check out what your efficiency has been like, or whether you wanna check out what your charging rate is, or you know set a charging timer you can do all that through the screen which is good to see and also uh, I find that this screen is mostly pretty good although I did have a couple of gremlins with wireless Apple CarPlay yesterday in terms of it not showing the Google Maps on the map screen only on the home screen so that was a bit strange but you've also got built-in sat nav if that's what you want to use instead with Google style overlays. So it does have a few different options for you. You also get that display shown up on the digital instrument cluster as well. I love the digital clusters. I love this virtual cockpit cluster in particular. It's very easy to interact with. And I like the fact that the controls are very easy on the steering wheel as well. A bit traditional maybe. Some people might think if they're spending this kind of cash on a high-end EV SUV that it should feel a bit different. But Actually, I think it does a really good job of feeling different enough. So let's check out the second row. It is a large SUV and it does have a fair amount of space in the back row. Look, this seat is set for my driving position. I'm about 182 centimeters or six foot. I've got enough room to sit back here comfortably. Um, lots of knee room, fair bit of foot room, decent headroom as well. So it is gonna be a well, well-suited family SUV if that's what you need, but you don't need three rows of seats because it doesn't have that. So, um, look, there are some really nice amenities in the back as well, as you would expect. You've got directional air vents here. Um, you've got dual USB-C ports down below, a 12 volt as well. Strangely though, you don't seem to get uh, controls for the climate control in the second row, which you might expect at this kind of money. Um, you do get them in the sportback version so if you are after the best experience for those in the back um, maybe consider that one but then again it does have the swooped roof line so it doesn't have as much headroom so 
yeah, it's a bit of a weird thing. But you also get these mat pockets. You've got bottle holders in the doors, as you would expect. And if you have children, there are ISO fix points in the window seats and top tethers as well, as you would expect, right? Plus, there's a fold-down armrest with a little fold-out cup holder section and a storage section here as well, so you can... I don't know what you'd put in there, maybe your phones or something to keep them out of sight as well. So yeah, it does have a fair amount of stuff going on here. A ski port as well, if you want to load long items through here. So yeah, fairly practical large SUV. And it would want to be, because it is a large SUV. And one final thing I really love about some Audi models is there is illumination around the seatbelt buckle. So at night, you can see where you need to put your buckle in. So the version of the Q8 e-tron that launches first is called the 55. So that means that it's a pretty high powered version. You'll see the power and torque figures for this dual motor all wheel drive electric model on your screen now. Yeah, it's got a single speed automatic transmission. So it is a pretty powerful model, but there will be, as I mentioned, a lower grade version with a bit less power and an SQ8 with a performance pack, which will have even more grunt. Look, the 0 to 100 time on this version is gonna be quick enough for most people. There's a boost mode it does it in about 5.6 seconds not to 100 it's not as fast as some other cars but this is a fair bit heavier than some of the other evs out there it's more than 2.5 tons unladen so it's pretty heavy but i do like the fact that you do get a few different cables included when you buy this car and there's a frunk so you can put your cables in here so they're out of the way they don't take up precious boot space it's nice to see one of the cool things about the Q8 e-tron is that it has a charge port on this side. This is the AC charger, and I'll just close that. Come with me and I'll show you another charge port. That's right, there's two different charge ports here for extra convenience. So on this side, you've got your AC and DC charge ports. So you've got a type two combination plug, as you would expect. Now, let me tell you some of the rates at which you can charge. AC at 7.2 kilowatts, that's the standard rate. And no, you can't plug in on both sides to get a faster rate, but you can option in a 22 kilowatt onboard charger, it's about $7,000. So that will mean that you'll get a lot faster charging at home. And you might need to because the battery pack in this car is huge. It's 114 kilowatt hours, which is one of the biggest batteries known to man. Um, it's about 106 kilowatt hours of usable battery. Now, if you're wondering what that means in terms of EV driving range, you'll see on your screen now the figure, which is the WLTP claim. Now, keep in mind though, that is the worst case scenario. So that's for a vehicle optioned with 22 inch wheels, a sunroof and heavy stuff on the inside in terms of extras. So that's worst case. You, so you might be able to actually achieve better than that in real world driving. I'll tell you what I achieved in the efficiency section a little bit later, but first I wanna tell you about DC charging. The maximum charge rate is 170 kilowatts, which isn't as fast as some other vehicles out there. That's because this is on a 400 volt architecture. Uh, some vehicles on an 800 volt architecture can well apparently do up to 350 kilowatts of fast charging now that means that 10 to 80 percent you're looking at about 31 minutes from a fast charger good thing to know though you also get a subscription to the charge fox network so free fast charging on the road if you can find one that works they are a little bit fickle some of those chargers but hey um, i think there's a lot going on here when it comes to battery technology for this launch drive of the Audi Q8 e-tron, Audi Australia brought us to Victoria, where we started in Melbourne and we've made our way out to Bendigo in central Victoria, across a mix of different roads to get here as well. A little bit of highway, a little bit of, well, a whole lot of country back road driving as well. So um, it's given us a pretty good indication of what this car is like to live with in Australian conditions. And it is pretty good, I've got to say. The things that I really like about it include the adaptive air suspension. So it's adjustable air suspension, so you can make it firmer and lower if you want to, or you can make it, well, softer and cushier if you are dealing with country back roads and stuff like that. So it does mean that it does fit into different scenarios pretty well in terms of the ride comfort and the character of the vehicle. Um, it's not necessarily a corner carving monster of a sporty SUV. It's not supposed to be either. Um, look, if you are looking for that, I would say wait for the SQ8 e-tron or just go and check out the RSQ8 petrol model because it's a beast and it feels properly sporty. But this car, 
doesn't necessarily feel sporty and I don't think it's supposed to and I don't think that that's a big deal. But what I will say is that compared to the previous e-tron model that was sold here, it does have a slightly better steering responsiveness to it. So it does change directions with a bit more, I guess, purpose than it used to. It used to feel just a little bit, well, sloppy, uh, but now it does feel just a touch more direct and accurate and offers a bit more feel or, you know, the perception of feel through the driver's hands. So I reckon it does have that uh, intuitiveness that you would expect uh, for a luxury SUV like this in terms of drivability. That means that it's also relatively easy to park. Um, I will say though that Personally, I would choose the model with the conventional side mirrors. I would not be choosing those digital mirrors, which they're an option pack. They cost about three and a half grand more. God knows what they would cost to replace if you ever had to. But um, yeah, it's it's a, uh, I guess a horses for courses thing. If you like the digital mirror look and you like the idea of that technical element to the car, sure. But for me, it's a hard no, thanks. It just means that the car is a little bit harder to park because your depth perception is never as good as it is when you've got a standard mirror. And speaking of parking, you do get a surround view camera, front and rear parking sensors, there's a parking system, so it'll park itself for you if you're not confident. So yeah, it's got that whole element of livability pretty well sorted. Look, this version, the 55, has, like I said, 300 kilowatts and 664 newton meters, and that is plenty. And for a lot of people, it's gonna be more than enough. So you have to ask yourself whether it's worth spending this much on the 55 version, or waiting for the 50 model, which will have less power and torque, but will be more affordable. So it really depends on what you're expecting. And look, I will say that even though this car is heavy and you can feel the weight of this vehicle in corners and even when you're accelerating it's not necessarily as neck snapping as some other EVs when it comes to putting your foot straight down on the pedal but um, look it is still definitely fast enough for most people's needs and if you need faster there's going to be faster models as well so look this ticks the box I would say for most people in fact it's going to double tick the box you might not need two ticks. Like a lot of EVs, there's regenerative braking and you can adjust how aggressive or assertive the braking is or how gentle it is. So you've got the left paddle here so you can put it into the most assertive mode and it does have a level of one pedal driving but it won't do the full abrupt stop thing that some other electric cars do when you take your foot off the accelerator. It does have a gentle gradual slowing to it. So look, it is relatively good in terms of the regen braking and the feel through the pedal as well is good. It does have a nice feeling to this brake pedal. So um, it does really tick the box when it comes to stopping as well as going. Okay, let's talk about efficiency. So this isn't the most efficient luxury EV SUV. You'll see the WLTP worst case scenario number on your screen. That's the kilowatt hours per 100 Ks. 25 kilowatt hours per 100 is pretty high, um, but this is a big, heavy, luxury SUV. So um, it's just a surprise that a car that has a battery that is 114 kilowatt hours isn't achieving something like 600 Ks of driving range, at least on paper. And remember, that's worst case scenario situation when it comes to that claimed figure. So if you're wondering what I've seen across a mix of driving from Melbourne out to Bendigo and back, you'll see it on your screen now, the average that I saw. So yeah, even higher than that official figure. So this is not the king of efficient electric SUVs, but hey, again, I'm not sure it's supposed to be. The Q8 e-tron has the maximum five-star ANCAP safety rating from 2019 testing. That was for the Audi e-tron SUV that came before it, but it still applies to this model and you still get a heap of standard safety technology and equipment that you would expect when you're paying this kind of money for an Audi SUV, including autonomous emergency braking, you've got 
pedestrian, cyclist and junction detection. There's lane keeping assistance, adaptive cruise control, traffic jam assist, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert. So all the stuff that you would expect is fitted to this car. There's front and rear parking sensors and a surround view camera as standard as well, which I like to see for a big family SUV. But weirdly, there's no traffic sign recognition, so it can't tell you what the speed limit is and adapt to it like some other EVs and SUVs can. And you only get six airbags, which is a bit strange for a big SUV like this. Lots of other large luxury SUVs have 10 or 11 airbags, but there's just dual front, front side and full length curtain in this car. No rear side airbags, which is just a bit strange. Just like all other Audi models, you get a five year unlimited kilometre warranty, but the battery pack is covered for eight years, which is good to see. It's the industry standard. And you also get a pretty sweet deal when it comes to some ownership aspects for this car. So you've got six years of free servicing, but the service intervals are every two years or 30,000 K. So you get the first three services at no cost, if you don't do heaps and heaps of Ks at least. And then there's also six years of roadside assist included and that six year access to the charge fox network at no cost plus audi will also install a charging thing for you at home if you need it so that's good to see so is it really a q8 well it does stack up from the luxury perspective and it does give people who are looking for a large audi suv a fully electric alternative that makes sense now because it does have a place to sit in the model line. And the fact that there's gonna be a whole bunch of other derivatives of the Q8 e-tron just means that, well, there's gonna be even more choice for buyers. But tell me, would you choose this car? I'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm not sure that it's the standout model for me just yet, but maybe the SQ8 or even the lower spec 50 version will make more sense. We'll have to wait and see, but stay tuned. I'll bring you those reviews when I can. And if you haven't already, please do like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.